and welcome to NLF Online 2020. I'm Karthika. I will be your anchor for this evening. We will have two panel discussions and one performance from now till 6.30 p.m. All of you must have already seen this on our social media posts. Each panel discussion will go on for about 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A segment. You could type out your questions into the Q&A box for the panelists to answer. If you'd like a specific panelist to answer, please do add this to your question as well. We will also launch polls while the panel is on, on topics relevant to the discussion, for the audience to engage with the panelists. We would love for you to share your opinions on these, and we will share them with the panelists before we begin the Q&A segment. I now invite two of the NLF co-founders, Ms. Kavita Gupta Sabarwal, and Ms. Rasi Lahuja to share their thoughts on the festival. Over to you, Kavita and Rasil. Namaskar. Hello, everyone. I'm Rasil Korahuja, and I welcome you to the 2020 Neve Literature Festival and NLF Online, where we bring the COVID, oops, I mean the conversations that matter around children's literature directly to you. I'd like to now introduce one of NLF's co-founders, Kavita Gupta Sabarwal. Kavita, over to you. Okay. Kavita's audio doesn't seem to be working. No problem, I'll take it from here. Normally at this point and this moment, Kavita would be expounding on the importance of history. She would ask you to consider why it is that when we live in the present and are so deeply in the throes of imagining a fabulous future that we should care about or bother so much with the past. You might have or may want to ask yourselves these questions. How did we get here? Why does the present look the way it does? And how does the past determine the direction of your future? And we would tell you that the answers to these questions lie in our history. Because if you don't understand the present, you'll be planning for your very bright future in the dark. To me, the best analogy is Google Maps. If you don't turn location on, it doesn't know where you are. And how will it get you to where you want to go? Sometimes you just need to retrace your steps, understand where you turned right or wrong, and embrace the path to your destiny. I'd like to leave you today, all the young people watching, with this message. Yesterday, you bore witness to our history. Today, you are the carriers of that history. And one day, you will be makers of that history. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Rasil. One of my co-conspirators for NLF and jury co-chair for Knee Book Awards. It's great to be online. It's a whole new intangible with exciting possibilities. We are doing this for two reasons. First, this allows us to move beyond our single location in Bangalore, joining lines across India and the world, something we've always really wanted to do, and not just for our audience, but also our panelists. Today, panelists join us from Canada, Delhi, Gurgaon, Raipur, Chennai, and Lonavla. Second, NLF Online grows the Neve Literature Festival from once a year episodic into a year round dial tone. Being episodic attracts the human brain, but we will only truly succeed in our mission of growing readers for life when young readers perceive reading as a constant. Our challenge is to always be purposeful in curating our sessions, which we intend to do. Our education system is always removing the complex, the nuance, the ununderstandable, leaving only the technical, the formulaic. But that takes away all imagination from our children, all hypothesizing, all wondering as they grow. Our discussion always aims to bring back the complex into conversations, into wonderings, into imagining. Our theme this year is imaginary lines, and you're probably wondering why. Because humanity is connected and separated by imaginary lines. The lines that connect us are fluid and formed by the languages we speak, the stories we share. The lines that separate us are drawn by genders with which we identify, the religions we bow to or the myths we believe in, and also the geographies that outline our experiences. When we stand on the opposite ends of these lines, the distance Distance seems vast, but all that is needed is a gentle tug to unravel differences in opinions and bridge misunderstandings. NLF imaginary lines will draw and redraw our experiences through stories, perhaps int intended for children, but really meant for all of us. With that, on to our Independence Day panels today, 
and the many lines that divide and join, set off by some horrific events in 1947 by the drawing of an imaginary line that partitioned the country into three parts. Now there's a complexity. We know when partition happened, but do we know why it happened or how it all really began? History, as all historians say, is all about studying perspectives and available facts. Over to our first panel. Thank you, Kavita and Rasil. Who we have with us today to moderate the first panel is a very exciting author. Now, as you all know, our first panel is on partition, memory and memorialization, moderated by Siddharth Sharma. Siddharth is a journalist, a historian, and has authored The Grasshopper's Run, Year of the Weeds, Carpenters and Kings, Western Christianity, and the Idea of India. He also has a new book coming out soon. Thank you so much for being here, Siddharth. We'll now hand it over to you to introduce the remaining panelists and to take the discussion forward. Thank you very much, Kartika. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm glad we'd all be here uh, under the circumstances. Uh, this is as good a time as any to look at our history, as Rasil mentioned, uh, to locate ourselves where we are today and to understand where we are going. Um, and in a conversation like this about independence, about partition, uh, it's very important that we listen to lived experiences and that we talk to people who are associated with trying to understand what partition is. I'm sure you have read about it in, in your school textbook. There are a lot of uh, things connected to uh, partition. It, it wasn't just a uh, historical event. It, it keeps affecting generations over the years. And today we have um, three very interesting, multifaceted, well-known uh, people uh, with whom we are going to talk about these. these. Our, first, uh, our first speaker is Malika Alwalia. She is uh, the CEO and co-founder and the curator of the Partition Museum at Amritsar. Our second speaker is Kamla Basim, uh, activist also a, a writer of children's books. I'm sure you've read uh, several of her work. And Mr. Santosh Sivan, the well-known cinematographer, director, and actor. Uh, so uh, the Partition Museum was started in 2016. So if you could just, if you could just tell us uh, how, how the idea started, because it's the first uh, museum of its, of its kind in India. Uh, it's been it's been more than uh, seventy years since the event, uh, and a, a lot of the a lot of the witnesses of that period are are no more. Uh, so, uh, how 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 did this idea begin? Could you just tell us yeah. about. Um, so, Siddharth, I mean, um, basically, I come from a partition family. My three of my four grandparents were affected by the partition, and. Um, so really, it was a very personal project for the founders um, uh, who clearly had parents or grandparents who had been impacted. And there was this sense that uh, we were um, running out of time, you know, that that generation was, it was now the last generation that was there. And we really felt very strongly that in their lifetime, uh, we, that there should be a museum or memorial that uh, acknowledges and shares their experiences. So from the very beginning, it was very clear that this was going to be uh, a people's museum that told the stories of the millions of people who were affected by the partition. And that was really the heart of it. Um, we started working on it in early 2015. And honestly, when we started, I thought that this is going to be like a 10 year journey. You know, we, we had no building, no collection, no money, no organization. We thought, okay, you know, we'll, we'll get there slowly, but we just got such an outpouring of support uh, from all directions. So many people came forward and really that was the only way the museum could happen because they shared their objects, their stories, um, volunteered their time, gave their expertise. Um, so, you know, we call ourselves a people's museum because we tell the stories of people, which is a very different way of understanding history rather than looking at nation states or leaders. We really talk about what happened with the people, but we're also a people's museum in the sense that it's really the efforts of just hundreds of people and their love and support that uh, made the museum possible because um, 
it was opened really quickly in time for the 70th anniversary because there was this collective sense that 70 years had been too long and uh, it really felt like uh, the museum needed to open. So. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the People's Museum part of it, the fact that these are these are histories of the people rather than uh, of, of uh, big names, administrators and, and, and rulers. So uh, a large part of the exhibits are also everyday objects of the people who, who survived uh, these events. Uh, what was the process like in, 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 in collecting these, uh, these exhibits and the stories that go with, with, these, with these objects? So it was really a, a very organic process. The first object that went into the museum was actually a book that my nani's family had carried with them when they came. Um, and, uh, you know, that became, uh, like I said, the first object in the museum. And we then slowly started uh, reaching out to more people, first within our own uh, circles. As we told more people, they started coming forward. We started doing small uh, pop-up exhibitions, um, you know, starting first with Delhi, then moving to other cities. And as people came to these and saw what we were trying to do, uh, they came forward. So this tin box you're seeing here uh, belongs to a, a lady called Sudarshana Kumari. And her family actually came to one of our exhibitions in early 2016, and they were so moved. Uh, they said, you know, we have objects in our family. So they gave us uh, this tin box. They gave us uh, a, a thali, a glass, uh, the things that they had carried with them uh, when they came. And slowly that's how the museum was built. So all the objects in the museum, you know, they tell the story from that very personal perspective. They say that this is my story. This is what happened to me, which is a very different way of looking at history because we often don't have that uh, perspective. And I think it's also one of the things that makes it really powerful and engaging for people when they come is that you hear, you know, every gallery has five or 60 monitors on it. You hear firsthand person testimony. Somebody says, I walked in the rain for three days without food or water. I had to hide under the train seat when the train was attacked. It's a very powerful first person account that really makes history come alive. Um, so really that it was a process of, uh, you know, reaching out to more people who then connected us to more people. And um, once we set up the curtain raiser of the museum in 2016, many people came there and, and felt moved uh, to, to share their family stories also. It's also a way of paying tribute uh, to your parents, grandparents, uh, to, to know that their story is being heard. And I think for a lot of people that was um, important. Uh, you know, the, the tin box you just saw when we recorded Subhashna Ji's interview, she, she cried and she said, finally, somebody is hearing um, what I went through, you know? So I think it was also cathartic uh, for a lot of, but it is a very different way of looking at history. And that's really part of what's in the museum. In addition to that, we do, as you see on the screen, we do have newspapers, we have archival photographs, we have the iconic videos from that time of the very tragic way people had to travel on foot in kafalas or uh, by train. Uh, so all of those things are there, but really the heart of the museum are these uh, objects that have been donated by families. So refugee cards, the document journeys uh, from camp to camp. We have uh, you know, clothing that they brought with them. We, we have the water pots that they used to get, uh, get water on their journey. And all of these tell that story so much more powerfully uh, because they are, they are very real lived experiences. Yes, uh, and you also mentioned the, the videos of accounts of witnesses of, of that period, which uh, the witnesses who were, who were, who were still alive. And, and uh, quite a lot of them have been posted on your website and these are accessible on uh, online. So for if the young people are interested in, in uh, watching these videos, they can access them. Gee, we, do, we do post a lot of things on our social media pages. If young people are interested, they should definitely uh, follow us on Instagram or Facebook uh, or Twitter. We do try and um, you know share uh, material and definitely more and more so since uh, COVID when the museum has now been closed for four months. So uh, it is obviously important uh, for us to increase that. So we have been uh, working on that also. Um, but otherwise, I, I actually a believer in the power of physical spaces. So I encourage everybody to come to the museum and uh, immerse themselves because I think that's also a very different way of experiencing it. It's built as a very multi-dimensional interactive uh, space. So, yeah. Yes. 
uh, talking of the actual visit, you also have um, art by noted Indian artists, uh, reprints of uh, limited edition reprints of of uh, by by the noted artists. And one of the things I found interesting was uh, almost all of them in their in their conversations with you have told you that at the beginning they did not think of of drawing or or painting their experiences. At the beginning, they were only focused on the the the, the basics of survival. It was only afterwards that they looked back and put their experiences in 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 art uh, yeah. what was it like talking to uh, talking to these these uh, great things so this gujral i think is one of the artists whose uh, works can be yes found. yes so we have satish gujral ji's paintings we have krishan khanna's uh, we have arpana kaur we have uh, sl prasher uh, it is interesting actually if you look at their different experiences how they uh, how they thought about art and uh, and their own memory or their own experience and uh, for example satish gujral as you say after partition he says i was not planning to paint partition but partition is what came out uh, you know and you can see in the, there's just such uh, power in those paintings you can see the agony uh, in many of those paintings that comes out with someone like sl prasher he became a camp commandant at um, the baldev nagar camp near haryana and he in haryana near ambala and he um he was so uh, distraught by what he saw all around him that he would just pick up any scrap of paper and sketch on it you know with like whatever piece of coal he could find or whatever you know stub of a pencil he could find so in the uh, uh, prints we have there you can still see the uh you know the crumpled nature of the paper that he literally just picked up anything with, and the, again you can see that agony like some of the paint uh, print, um, sketches are called cheek you know screech and things like that you can see the power in it so uh, in fact this weekend we're doing a online um exhibition a virtual exhibition where many eminent uh, and emerging artists have come together uh, they've put forward their works and it's called memories unlocked um and it talks about this idea of the connections between art and identity art and home art and memory uh, so i encourage everyone to go uh, online and and look at that yes um i'm sure they will uh, you've also had uh, you've also had sessions with young people who who visit your museum and record their experiences and uh, you uh, you have we have some uh, some videos of of these uh, these young people so Could we maybe uh, maybe see one or two of them? Yeah. So actually, for us young people, uh, the youth are a very important um, uh, target audience. We've really tried from the beginning to engage with them. Uh, we have a, a, a strong school engagement program, um, and that works with both uh, the you know private schools who want to come. We've had schools from Delhi come. from bangalore schools from bombay they come and visit us and we do a series of guided activities in addition we have started um uh, uh, a set of activities with local uh, schools uh, government schools lower socio economic demographics uh, who otherwise might not have visited a museum so uh, i want to play you a short clip of uh, one of the girls who came through this uh, government school program and um you know she for example had never been to a museum before um so I, i'll just play you the clip and then i'll talk a bit more about it going to quickly play a short one more short clip
Hi, um, everyone. Malika, there seem to be a few technical glitches with the video playing. So what if we share it with the audience members um, after the panel discussion? Would that be all right? OK, so those two clips um, give you a sense of, uh, hi, am I still there? Yes. OK, great. Um, did you see them? Was I sharing my screen? Yeah, we saw the first one. We oh, dear. First OK. One. But you heard the second one? No problem. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. we, did. we heard some of it. OK, OK. But, so, yeah. uh, so sorry about that. Um, so basically, um, Siddharth, what I wanted to just share through those clips was, you know, we all grew up in an education system where we did have some exposure uh, to museums. Um, but what you often see is it's kind of a forced march past, you know, like you go into these things and you see these school groups and they're in a line and they're being told, don't touch anything, don't, you know, do this, don't do that. And so one thing we were very clear about is that was not how we wanted uh, young people to engage with our museum. So that's been built into the design, but it's also been built into the activities that we do uh, with students when they come. So, um, for example, the museum is very, it's got a lot of audiovisual in it, like a lot of these oral history videos. So we find that students really find that very engaging. Even if they don't want to read the text, they really engage very much with uh, the videos. Um, in addition, we've designed activities so that they are um, very, what you would call reflective. You know, you, so you want to have, we, we cover some amount of facts. Uh, we do want people to learn something about history, but bulk of what we do with the students is what we would call reflective or dialogic activities, where we say, look back on the future, what, you know, look back on the past, what have you, what, what have you learned, what do you think, but also look to the future, how does this apply to your life? So you, I don't know if you heard the, the second one, but in the yeah. first one, uh, she was asked that question and she said, you know, this history is 70 years old, how does it matter to you? Uh, you know, yeah. and so her takeaway very interesting conclusions. She, from and the second student, she, she had, she had drawn very interesting. You could hear her or not. She said that what she took away from it was hope. You know that yeah. these refugees came; they lost everything. She gave the example of Milka Singh and uh, the uh, person who founded MDH, and said they came, they lost everything, and yet they move forward. And women, especially, should not miss. Uh, and so she said that is really important. That's what she. So for us, we use the base of the partition to talk about a much broader set of things. We talk about um, freedom, we talk about empathy, we talk about resilience. Yeah. Um, and so really try and uh, we've designed a set of activities that students engage in um, and to, to really make them um, think a bit more about how uh, we can learn from the, A, learn from the past, but also uh, learn from it for the future. And especially Right. understand that this is their own history you know so one of the other set of things yes. that we do is get students to record the stories of their grandparents and that has been incredibly effective uh the student you know we've heard from so many cases that uh it has opened up dialogues within families uh the things that uh, you know yes. you have never been spoken about uh, between grandparents and grandchildren and now once they open that dialogue and you're talking about something like this it opens up a lot of other spaces also um, so that's again been something yes. uh, we found has uh, has worked really uh, well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, talking about dialogue and hope, uh, Kamla Basim, uh, activist, poet, uh, children's author, uh, girls also want Azadi, Rainbow Girls, Rainbow Boys. We are familiar with her words, and we are familiar with what. Uh, she has done in terms of engagement with her friends in Pakistan. It's a long story covering uh, covering several decades of of friendship built over several visits. Uh, Kamla, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. So if you could, if you could, if you could yes, if you could tell us about about how you uh, how you built this this friendship with with uh, with people across the border. You were born there in 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 uh, Shahida Wali. That's where the story begins. First of all, Azadi Zindabad, friends, celebrating at least our liberation, our freedom from the British. The other freedoms are yet to come for the majority of the people of our countries. Yes, uh, Siddhartha, I was uh, born in a tiny village in Punjab called, beautiful name called Shahida Wali. 
But my father was already, as a young man, working in Rajasthan. So after my birth, we came back. This was 1946. And then suddenly, my village, which was in India, they told me went to Pakistan. I don't know how the village moved to Pakistan. I mean, but it went. And then it was only after 40 years, 1983, that I went back to Pakistan as a grown up woman, because now I was working with the United Nations and doing a South Asia work with human rights defenders, NGOs, people's organizations, bringing them together to share their views and experiences with each other. Because I have always felt that what I can learn from US or Canada or America, I can barely implement in the villages of India. But if there is a good project in Pakistan which has succeeded, then I can copy it here. So that's the work I have done now for 46 years. So between 1983 and 2020, I must have visited Pakistan like 55 to 60 times. And some of my closest friends are from there. And in fact, the slogan, I'm quite famous for Azadi, was a slogan I learned from the feminists in Pakistan. They were at that time fighting President Ziaul Haq and his anti-women policies. And that's where I had learned it. And in the last 35, 40 years, we have had a lot of exchanges of people from one country to another, exchanges of books. You know, I wrote a book for, I wrote children's rhymes, challenging gender norms where father is changing the nappies and singing a lullaby. They were put to music by a friend called Munize Hashmi. She's also the younger daughter of Faz Ahmed Faz. So she has an organization there called um, Azad Foundation. So lots and lots of um, relationships, friendships. In fact, between yesterday and today, we have had four webinars on Indo-Pak friendships. So there is a whole group of people who want India and Pakistan to live together as neighbors. And that's what we are, we are working on. You also have an, you also have an annual tradition which, which you observed uh, last night on the intervening night of August 14 and 15 where, where you meet uh, near the Wagha border. This time it was not possible, so you met. Uh, mm -hmm online. So, but uh, so how did that tradition begin? 24 years ago, um, many peace activists led by Kuldeep Nair, one of our senior most citizens, passionate about peace, and Asna Jahangir, a lawyer, human rights defender in Pakistan, and hundreds of others. 24 years ago, we started it and we said we will meet at the Atari and Vaga border every year on the night of 14th and 15th. So first we would have a two, three hour program in Amritsar and in Lahore. Then we will all go to the border. And whenever the relationships were good between the two countries, we were allowed actually to see each other, come that close. But then these days we just, are about half a kilometer away from each other. We can sometimes hear each other's slogans, but we can't meet each other or see each other. But we still go. And the media, they come with us, so at least we can tell the world that it is not true, that Indian and Pakistani citizens don't want peace. Maybe our governments don't want peace, Maybe other governments of other countries don't want peace, but majority of the people of the two countries, I believe, want peace. And the people who do these 
are those people who have this slogan boli boli no bullets dialogue my two most favorite slogans have been main arhat par bani deewar nahi main to us deewar par padi darar hu i'm not a wall that divides i am a crack in that wall and my other slogan is walls turned sideways are bridges so you know we can either talk of separation or just remove the s s put an r it be reparation reparation bringing people together and sometimes sadar families have partitions among them brothers have partitions sisters have partitions but a partition just means that i am making my own space and after that we can be friends and we believe neighbors have to be friends we can't throw pakistan from our neighborhood pakistan can't throw us from our neighborhood and there is so much yes. which unites us so we keep hoping for peace and love and friendship you also have you also have young people who participate in in making uh, peace calendars yeah there is a fantastic group uh, called uh, aagaaz e dosti the beginning of friendships these are people from both sides and they work with school children and college children and again for the last 10 or 15 years they have been having competitions in schools and saying make a picture of indo pak friendship and then six pictures are selected from pakistan and six from india and those 12 pictures make the calendar year after year and then those are shared in both the countries there is another fantastic organization started by two big media houses aman ki aasha the hope of peace and then there is pakistan india peace forum i mean there are dozens and dozens of organizations working for peace but unfortunately yes i'm sure our young viewers would would like to would like to participate in in these in these activities i'm sure some of them have already i'm sure right um yeah. mr seven Yes, I'm here, Mr. Sivan. Are you there? Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, you know, we we talked about we talked about art that that comes out of partition and the independence period. Mm. We talked about how it's visualized by by succeeding generations, and a lot of how we have visualized the independence movement comes from uh, the cinema created by you. Uh, but before i i go on to to kala pani and uh, before the rains i i want to talk to you about that before that i wanted to talk about uh, tahan and uh, birbal the donkey and <laughs> and uh, making cinema for children uh, what, actually, has, what has the experience been like how how is yeah actually it was amazing listening how is to making cinema for children how it was actually amazing listening to malika and kamla talk about the you know involvement i love to go to the museum i love what uh, kamla has been doing i think it's amazing uh, it was actually i was not aware of uh, all this actually so, but it's very good um i think uh, see uh, freedom movement for us uh, uh, because we were born post um, independence so it has only been stories you know so i listened to a lot of interesting stories most of the time uh, it used to be about um, uh, people having to lose so many most of them are in uk now so they shifted base to uk and they succeeded very much there but they always tell me that they used to have so much of thing that said to you know forgo and 
come back here and things like that. So a lot of people's uh, future has been reshaped by partition, I would say. I have not had a direct experience with it, but uh, uh, I've actually uh, been thinking about it only because, you know, uh, at one point in time, my dad used to take me through uh, uh, to this place called uh, uh, Wynard, which is uh, winding roads uh, to, to the uh, hill stations of Wynard, you know, the Spice Village where I thought it would be interesting. And my dad used to tell me that these roads were built by the British people, uh, though there are no Britishers that time, you know, which uh, prompted me to make a film on culture clashes and how a road will uh, intrude into nature, uh, things like that. And uh, so I made a film like that. And finally, a person who actually uh, was totally subjugated to a British uh, person uh, in the T estate finally decided that he has to think of himself as a own person and decides to join uh, the freedom movement. So I've made films like that because of whatever I've heard of these things. And uh, so Tahan is a very interesting thing because Tahan is, uh, when I went to Kashmir to do the film, my whole impression of Kashmir actually changed because it was not about what I was reading in the press. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So it is not about reading what is in the press. It had a different reality there, you know, uh, because, you know, my ch film was about a donkey and, you know, and also I was helped by a lot of uh, writers from Kashmir. So the film is very metaphorical because it dates back to Akbar, if you look at names and things like that. And so it talks yes. uh, in a wholesome way about Kashmir. Uh, which is why actually the Kashmir people also wanted me to come and make more films there. But the fact is that uh, it did not try to, uh, you know, have the usual formula of uh, the terrorist versus the military uh, police and thing, uh, the army and things like that. But it tried to see a positive side to it, you know, which is what I like it to be in a children's film, almost like a fable, actually. You know? But when I went there, I realized that a lot of people... Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the plight of, despite independence uh, and all that, the Kashmiri pundits went to hell, you know, and it's not because of their Muslim yes. uh, neighbors or anyone. The Muslim neighbors were very supportive of them. But uh, the people who came right. from outside or from wherever, they attacked when these people, the Muslim people were in their, uh, in the mosque, you know. So it's, it, the reality there is very different because you cannot suddenly disengage people who have grown up together and suddenly become hostile, you know. So I think, you know, if you look at it in a detailed manner, I would say that uh, uh, even Kashmiris uh, today, a lot of people think that it, is a, it was a black period in their time when the pundits who they had existed long time back had to, you know, uh, be going away as refugees. So I think, you know, every place yes. has stories and these stories uh, just carry on, whether in literature or in movies or whatever. And whatever little thing that we can do, we, of course, try to uh, add on to it because, you know, filmmaking is not very easy because there's a lot of commercial aspect to it also. So it cannot just be uh, whatever you feel like. Though I think there are quite a few of them who would like to express themselves to celluloid because it has such a mass reach, you know. Uh, but the fact yes. is that when I, actually when I was shooting Kalapani, you know, the film, and I got to a yes. lot of stories of what uh, uh, kind of uh, people who knew about uh, the British people and how they actually uh, believed in divide and rule, you know. The divide and rule right. thing was very much uh, prominent and so actually they encouraged it more and more to happen, you know which actually uh, carried so on. So you talked to veterans of the... Uh, yeah, some yes. of them. Some so of Mr. Simon, who... uh, while shooting, uh, when you talk to veterans. And, huh? uh, and how, did you, how did you visualize that period? As a, as a you know, as, as cinema, how did you visualize that period? Did you, did you rely on photographs, archival footage, uh, videos? Yeah, actually, that's quite elaborate, you know, uh, to uh, put together everything. Because I think, you know, when you make films... Sometimes you just want to make something very realistic and true to what you have seen. And sometimes filmmakers get an opportunity right. to create your own world, you know. 
So uh, this is uh, yeah. like your own world. And if you go to a place like Andamans, which I don't know if you have gone to, there's this place called Ross Island, which is amazing because they yes. had made an exact replica of a British society with bakery, church, everything like that, you know. And today it is full of, fully in ruins and taken over by the trees. It's an amazing place, actually. So you yes. get inspired by seeing all these things and then maybe you try to uh, do some kind of justice to it. But the story that I heard was very interesting because this guy was very upset, actually, uh, about partition and everything in general, actually, because he was selling uh, something that uh, uh, India uh, had the most peaceful independence, you know, where the British people left and there was no bloodshed. But it is strange that after that, there was so much of bloodshed and bitterness when the partition happened. Yes. And so this gentleman was saying, why couldn't the Hindus and Muslims think and get subdued for 300 years before, for 300 years, why did they subdue themselves? Why couldn't they get together and chase these people out instead of taking all this rubbish? You know? So it is a very different way of looking actually. But the fact is that a world over, everyone knows that we have had a freedom uh, struggle which was very peaceful. But what followed that is, is uh, it's unbelievably tragic actually. So I think you know, if you yes. look at it that way, and when he says it because maybe he has lived through some of the experiences, it, it, you realize that this divide and rule which started with the Portuguese. You know, I also made a film about the Portuguese coming and you know, uh, taking over our place and things like that. Fuinkela uh, for spices. So it has been going on since then. You know? and, uh, and it is just, uh, and, you know, when you look at today, Babri Masjid happening, uh, I sometimes feel uh, it is almost like um, more than religion. Uh, and language and everything. I feel uh, the whole uh, uh, turbulent quality of the humans is basically uh, like a mob mentality. You know? I feel it's a mob mentality. I, I personally think that you know when people get together uh, and suddenly they can stand for religion, language, states. We have been seeing it all over the world actually. And so, and for that matter, yeah. even children who are studying in school or in college, they can unite and be very violent, you know. So I think uh, it is just a matter of uh, something or something that ignites them, you know. And then they can become a very different sort of people irrespective of religious and everything, you know. Which you see all over India, actually, you, you realize that that happens quite often, actually. So I think it is a, basically a mob yes. reaction also. So religion might be just a, another aspect of it. But it can be in language, right. uh, states, uh, everything, you know. So I think uh, and right. when, you, when you reflect on it, you also realize that people do say that men hunt in pack, you know. Uh, for example, I have this uh, very good friend of mine who was a taxi driver in UK. So when I went to uh, film uh, in UK, I used to have this uh, Pakistani taxi driver who always used to be with me. And for him, Seeing me was like the most delighted thing in his world. You know what I mean? Because suddenly he identified mm -hmm. himself and me as uh, brothers, like uh, even though I don't even speak the language Hindi. And uh, so he had so much to share. And his common uh, enemy was the Goras or the whites, you know, because I think he must have gone through hell yes. because of that, you know. And he used to always complain and do this yes. and do that and celebrate everything. And to the point that I think, you know, I was in one of their parties and it was strange. But when uh, England, uh, when India beat England, they were rejoicing. It is not the same case when Pakistan okay. in India play. But uh, when India is playing Australia, almost all of them are uh, actually, uh, you know, trying to encourage India to beat Pakistan. Because there's some kind of a common... Um, op you know, opposition like that, you know, and suddenly they're all brothers, yeah. and you know, you feel that uh, uh, have you been reading the papers wrong or whatever, you know, and uh, what is happening in the border, just like Kamala was telling, there is a lot of uh, love with the people right. because we all share a common kind of a background. So, I think sometimes I feel that uh, maybe which is why I think you know, we like to make films which might uh, somehow, somehow give you a feeling of that, even though I have not really made. 
a film totally on freedom movement or anything like that. Uh, maybe I'm not uh, really well versed in it, but the fact is that uh, I think most of uh, Indians are all peace-loving people, you know, at the end of the day. So I think uh, we all like peace yeah. and whether there is different kind of movements, we are also uh, very objective. See, we are from, I'm from Kerala right. and we still, uh, you know, have a very different way of governing things and, you know, following a very different kind of a pattern than the normal, uh, traditional way, you know what I mean? So I think, uh, uh, I think what we require is uh, through literature and like uh, you people are doing this, uh, stories, you educate the people. I think the people need to be educated and they need to be objective about what they should be thinking, not be fed with uh, right. this and that and media and all these things. They should actually... Uh, be empowered by having their own mind and speaking for themselves. For that, I think it is important yes. that we spread literature and you know everything, uh, so that they can uh, view it very objectively. You know, like uh, the museum right. and like uh, Kamala's uh, endeavors, which is amazing. I think. I think it is uh, really. I, I should uh, hats off to people who are so committed and so much in uh, you know doing things like that. I, I'm really um, touched by all that. Thank you. A, a message of hope there. A yeah. message of hope. Uh, yeah. Kamala, before we, move on to, before we move on to audience questions, and I'm sure there are a lot of them, uh, Kamala, I got to know uh, that you visited the museum for the first time uh, last year. So what were your impressions of it? As Mallika was saying, that, you know, you actually hear so many voices there. I mean, every room has these videos going on. And you listen to real people talking about real stories. That's, just, that's absolutely fascinating. So I was very, very impressed. And I was very happy that those things are there. And they're not just, you know, I mean, the stories of, people helping each other also. And they're not all stories of hatred and the conflict. They're stories of love. They're stories where both sides give so much to each other to save each other. So I think it's, right. as, you know, it's an absolutely unique thing and, uh, and a beautiful building. I mean, I was very happy to see yeah. that building in a very beautiful area. Yes. Yeah. And these narratives are also very important to talk about today, considering where we are as a country in terms of uh, independence. You know, I just want to say one of the questions we were asking whether it is important to talk to our children in the past. I mean, it's absolutely important. But if you look at our mainstream media, I mean, every night on majority of the television, you think as if there's a virtual war going on between India and Pakistan, every right. night after night. So since that kind of propagandistic and really I hate producing stuff going on, we might as well teach our children some real facts that, you know, why it happened. That Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the first step towards correcting a lot of uh, things that might have gone wrong yeah. with our more recent history. Uh, shall we move on to the results of the polls and uh, questions from the audience? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we do have a few results from the polls that we'll share. But before that, I just want to tell the audience that we see that a lot of you have raised your hand. Because it's a Zoom webinar, we're not able to take questions personally. But we hope that you've had your questions clarified by typing them in the Q&A box. So the polls that we asked our audience was first, do you know there is a partition museum in Amritsar? 55% um, of them have said no, but 8% of them have said they've visited. And we have some very uh, flattering and appreciative remarks about the Partition Museum that's there in the Q&A section that we'll share with all of you very, very soon. Do that's you or your... I know, it's wonderful. Do you or your family have friends from across the borders? 65% of them have said no, which is quite interesting. Have you watched the following films on Partition? You've given them a list of five films. Um, we have Gandhi, which is a front runner, followed by the legend of Bhagat Singh. So that's it for the polls. Uh, we have one interesting question that's come up from the students, which I will just share with you. 
This is from Azad Rishikesh. Do you think school children are taught about the history of partition enough? What else can be done so that children understand the history of partition and apply it to the modern context to make the world a better place? Mallika, I must tell Azad that I love his name. I wish my parents had called me Azad, but Mallika will answer the question. Ji, I think, I mean, um, uh, you know, obviously I don't think enough has been taught about our history. And I think especially the way history is taught uh, in our schools, it's very much about mugging up every single fact. I mean, that is certainly how I learned history was memorizing my history book from back to front and making sure I regurgitate it on the exam. And that unfortunately makes history very dry for a lot of people. Um, whereas we have such a rich and vibrant history, not just of the freedom struggle, but even beyond. And so I think one thing that we have found particularly effective, coming back to this idea of the People's Museum, is really to talk about how history affected your community, your family, your neighborhood, your town, your village, the country, you know, like, so, but, but look at it uh, from the perspective, not just of the nation state or the leader, but, uh, you know, it, once you start talking to young people or old people, uh, it's immediately uh, much more interesting. So I think that would be something I would highly encourage that let's take history out of, uh, you know, the context of just, yay, this is the Gandhara Buddha that we must all look at, which, you know, is very beautiful. But let's also talk about the history of the people. And I think when you start doing that, you find students uh, engaging a lot more. And I, I've already talked a bit about what we do at the museum and we have an extensive school outreach program. We love taking pop-up exhibitions in a non-COVID world um, to schools. So if anyone here is interested in that, we'd be happy to do that. We like doing a lot of activities with students. Um, so again, our museum is definitely there as one spot uh, to engage with students on uh, the partition. We have a program for that. If you're interested, please email us at info at partitionmuseum.org. But other than that, I think any school uh, could take up this baton. We've had schools who have had children uh, create their own projects and their own exhibitions. And for example, we tied up with Dune School a few years ago where they, the students there looked at the history of Dune at the time of partition. You know, they, they, their students uh, went across the border. There were letters that were engaged, uh, exchanged. There were students who couldn't come back. And we then came in with our extra archival material and co-curated a much larger exhibition. But the base of it was uh, the experience of the school. And that could be done with in any school. You don't. You could look at the history of the students, their grandparents, great-grandparents, with the freedom struggle. Where were they? Where were they when that happened? What were they thinking of? And that immediately makes history more engaging. So I would encourage uh, everyone here to try and look at that aspect of history. Thank you so much, Malika. Um, Siddharth, Kamala, and Malika, we have one interesting question from a student, um, Ditya Nair. And because both you, Kamala, and Malika, you've done so much work, um, the student is asked, how does it feel to set up something which has such a large impact? I haven't. I haven't set up anything like the museum, but I have set up networks and friendships which are located in the hearts of people. And these are not few hearts, they are by now. I mean, I've been doing this work since 1975. So 45 years and thousands of hearts have these musea have these temples and masjids of love and friendships. And all of us are believers of love and friendship. And I, I mean, you have no idea how it feels. I mean, And I was thinking today that, you know, even in our families, we teach so much othering, you are a Hindu, you are a Muslim, you are rich, you are poor, how we narrow the world of our children. I mean, our children are born human. The whole world belongs to them. But then they turn us into, you are a girl, you are a Hindu, you are a Brahmin, you are a Dalit, you are a South Indian, you are dark, you are... I mean, if we could just free our children and 
go back to the notion that we are born human. Nature makes us human. And somehow tell the society not to play these power games. And I think these are all power games. These are games to, peep, to keep some people down, like women, like Dalits, like minorities, like transgender people. And, you know, I've been doing this work for 46 years, but my God, the freshness of this work and, and, and the challenge of this work. And my life has been full of tragedies, full of personal challenges. And I feel if I had not had this work, I would be, I would be dead. Matlab, meri death hi ho jati. Matlab, maybe not physical death, but mental. And it is this work where you have something larger than your self-interest. Not just me and my two children. I mean, dogs look after 20 children. What is human beings looking after one child or two children? So I can tell everybody there's nothing like having a job which is like your hobby. So your hobby should be your jobby. Thank you so much, Kamala. I think those are great thoughts uh, for us to come to a close. But Siddharth, I'll leave you to do this. Yes. Uh, and, and before we end, I, I had a question for, for Mr. Sivan. Mr. Sivan, unmute again. So then, Are you there, sir? Okay, I think uh, I think we've, we've lost. Him. No, 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 no. I am here. I am here. I am very much here. I've been okay. listening. Right. To, I've been yeah. listening to the charming Kamala talking about her. This thing. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, she had a beautiful message. I want yeah. to ask you, Mr. Seven, what is it? What is it like uh, shooting with children? What is it like making cinema with children? How is the experience different from uh, from uh, so-called? Actually, movies? I've made quite a few children's movies. You know, basically, whatever I learned in school, yeah. I wanted to make into films. You know, uh, so whatever little stories I uh, had and some personal experiences, I think uh, working with children is uh, uh, not. I would say is easy. Uh, it is not like working with Salman Khan and Shah Rukh Khan, of course. Uh, it's a very different kind of uh, uh, different kind of a thing because I believe that uh, you have to let the child take you forward, you know. So it is about going with the flow, you know. Most children have are will take a chance, you know. They will take a chance with you because you know when I was uh, very, uh, uh, you know, when I was taking some class for kids and. Uh, uh, we were uh, we asked uh, these uh, children in the eight eight years or more to draw their favorite picture, you know. And uh, you will find that out of uh, ten, about eight or nine of them would uh, paint the typical one sunrise and two hills and six birds flying and one boat and something, you know, their favorite picture. But one or two would do very different kind of things, you know. So one such person decided that the most beautiful thing is God, so she wanted to paint God, okay? So the teacher said, but how will you paint God? You have not seen it before. Then she looked at her and said, in two minutes, I will show you how he looks, you know? So they will take the chance. So I think it is very important to listen to them and try to go with their flow than trying them to manipulate, to do like this and do like that which is what I've been uh, doing all this time. And it, it's very strange because, uh, uh, good thing you asked me this, because see, one of my girl in Mali, she's a scientist in US now. Uh, the one in Halo has got married, you know, and uh, to a Chinese person actually. And so they come and cook Chinese food for me. And she always uh, hates me for, teach, for treating me, uh, treating her like a little one. And then another one in Tahan is now in Australia. So all these people still keep in touch. And I'm very, very, you know, it is something like a revisit actually. You know? So then you realize that when I did a film called Malli, which is a, uh, which is a film uh, uh, which I learned in school actually, and I want to make it. And then I cast one particular girl uh, for the main role, but I had a lot of people auditioning for that role. And there was one girl who was deaf and dumb and she was very upset that she's not going to be in the film because she's deaf and dumb, you know. 
So, uh, so then you realize that you didn't want to make her feel bad, and you wanted, and she was full of enthusiasm and all that. So I decided that I will incorporate her into the film, you know. Uh, and so you incorporated her into the film and changed the story a bit, so that we would give her. Uh, because if you're going to make it for children's film, a children's film, then it should be for all children. You know what I mean? And then used her yeah. in a very interesting way. But we used to treat her very normally. You know, we would take her to the middle of the forest, make her sit on the road, and then all of us will disappear just to see what she will do. So we were never uh, over kind to her or anything because that I think is not a great idea. Because when people like that who are a little bit, uh, you know, have a handicap. They always feel that they are given a privilege because of the handicap. So we always try not to give them that, uh, 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 to give them that feeling, and we treat them all very normal. You know, so it's a great fun to have children. But I still haven't figured out how I'll how I'll handle my eleven-year-old son even now. <laughs> but that is also about it actually. <laughs> that's a, that's an ongoing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thank you, thank you very much for your insights. Thank yeah, you very much for yeah, your insights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank the panelists for the wonderful discussion, and uh, and, and you too, audience. Siddharth. You've been amazing. And uh, we thank you, thank you very much, yeah. Kartika. Thank you so much, Siddharth. I think we yes. Come So uh, we can we can proceed. Uh, sure. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Siddharth, Kamla. Mr. Santosh and Malika for sparing your time. Uh, we are very grateful that we got to hear from you and that we got to spend the launch of our event with you. Thank you so much.